Over the past couple of days, it looks like the Biden administration has now publicly gone on the offensive against Israel with more vigor than in the previous months. The reason for this is likely something to do with Joe Biden wanting to pre please his Democrat base as the November elections loom ever closer. For example, in the recent primaries in Michigan, 100,000 of Biden's voting base abstain from voting for him in order to register their protest against his Israel policies, calling for him to be even tougher on Netanyahu. Similar to the Labour Party in the UK, the left-wing base is pushing the leaders to further and further radical positions against Israel. Following this, Biden openly criticised Israel in his State of the Union address and was caught on a hot mic saying that he and Netanyahu were going to have a, quote, come to Jesus meeting about the situation. Sounds ominous. Only today, Biden said that Netanyahu is, quote, hurting Israel more than he is helping, end quote. It is highly unusual for a president to make partisan comments about a political figure in a different country's democracy, particularly when it involves America's strongest ally in the Middle East. These critical comments and more have come amidst widespread criticism of Israel in the mainstream media for the way that aid has been distributed in Gaza. For example, on the 29th of February, an aid convoy was swarmed by tens of thousands of Gazans as it entered the city of Gaza itself in the north. During the chaos, there was gunfire and 115 Gazans were killed. Similar to the incident with the Al Shifa hospital last year, this was broadcast around the world largely as a massacre perpetrated by Israel on innocent civilians. The incident was described by Qatar's Ministry for Foreign Affairs as a, quote, heinous massacre, end quote. Emmanuel Macron condemned the what he called shootings and said that he had deep indignation for the civilians that had been targeted by Israel. Targeted by Israel. In their usual disastrous fashion, the CNN put out a headline saying that 100 were killed when the IDF, quote, opened fire as people waited for food, end quote. Only a few hours after the event, it was clear that this was an egregious manipulation of the truth. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, in his own special world of Jew hatred, condemned the incident and implied that Israel were not doing enough to get aid into Gaza. Even more outrageously, a resolution was put forward at the UN to blame Israel entirely for the 100 tragic deaths. The only reason this resolution did not pass was because the US vetoed it. The pattern is always the same. An initial horrific story emanates from the Gaza Strip, causing shockwaves around the world as the mainstream media turn their word cannons on the Jewish people. And finally, when the facts of the case come out, the world has moved on, with the mainstream media finding some new way to blame Israeli forces in Gaza. This week, the results of the IDF's probe into the aid convoy tragedy was finally published. The aid convoy was driven by Palestinian contractors, who were driving a convoy of 38 trucks into the area of northern Gaza, the Gaza city itself, at 4am in the morning. However, a crowd of some 12,000 Palestinians swarmed the convoy from the east and west, beginning to loot the supply trucks. At the same time as the trucks were being looted, several Palestinians also started to advance towards some nearby Israeli tanks. At this stage, the Israeli troops near the tanks fired precisely towards that particular group, and less than 10 of the casualties were caused by Israeli fire. Drone footage now shows that the Palestinian contractors driving the trucks continued moving while they were being swarmed by 12,000 people, likely resulting in the tragically high death toll in the ensuing chaos. Nevertheless, the condemnatory headlines that whizzed around the world have done their jobs. Very few people are likely to pause and look back and consider what might actually have happened in retrospect. The demonization of Israel is easy. The damage is done. Picking up the facts of the case afterwards, people are less interested in that. Since the beginning of the war, 
around 267,000 tons of aid has been delivered to Gaza by 14,000 trucks. As reported by the American Jewish Committee, Israel does not impose limits on the amount of aid entering the territory. In reporting on stories of Israel's insufficient aid activities, news, acti news outlets like ABC News often quote organizations like UNRWA, the corrupt UN organization, as evidence for Israel's insufficiency in completing this task. The responsibility for the tragic situation for Gazan civilians is something that lies squarely at the door of Hamas. The purpose of considering incidents like this is not to make political statements, but rather to see the way that the mainstream media is working to manipulate the narrative against the Jewish people. In the words of Isaiah 59, truth has fallen in the streets. Reactionary, alarmist, condemnatory headlines fly around the world, even influencing policymakers and lawmakers in their decisions about Israel. We expect to see a rise in anti-Semitism in the latter days, heralding the time when all nations will be gathered together against Jerusalem for battle. One of the hugely significant learnings of our post-October the 7th world has been the unleashing of a new level of anti-Semitism. The undercurrents for the way that the progressive left so quickly turn against Israel was something that could already be seen. But over the last few months, this has been on a whole new level. The media machine has snowballed into a worldwide movement of anti-Semitism. We now hear genocidal slogans from the streets of London to the streets of Tehran on a virtually weekly basis. Join us again next week for another edition of Bible in the News. This has been Daniel Blackburn joining you.